Well, welcome to this interview with Dr. Eben Alexander, who has kindly agreed to answer some essential questions about life, death, and the afterlife. Dr. Alexander spent over 25 years as an academic neurosurgeon until his extraordinary near-death experience in 2008. He later described this experience in the best-selling book, Proof of Heaven. Since then, he has been reconciling his rich spiritual experience with contemporary physics and cosmology and is a pioneering scientist in consciousness studies. Dr. Alexander has been a guest on Dr. Oz, Oprah, and many other media programs. His most recent book, Living in a Mindful Universe, co-authored with Karen Newell, has garnered accolades from scientists around the world. And I'm so happy to have this opportunity to speak with you, Dr. Eben Alexander. Well, John, thanks so much for having me on. I always enjoy uh, any interaction with you and the Theosophical Society. So uh, it's great to be with you today. Excellent. Well, being uh, having this opportunity to speak with a neuroscientist, and, uh, and the first question obviously would be, how does modern neuroscience understand consciousness? Well, I would say modern neuroscience is making tremendous headway uh, in understanding consciousness, but it's only by rejecting and leaving behind the false assumptions of materialist science. Uh, this was all something that was made very clear uh, in the kind of philosophical presentation of what's called the hard problem of consciousness by David Chalmers, an Australian philosopher in his mid-1990s book, The Conscious Mind. But the issue had been brewing for decades. And in fact, many uh, uh, very wise philosophers who study the mind and brain and their relationship had already come to realize <clears throat> that physical matter of the brain does not create consciousness de novo, that there's something much more profound going on that implies really the of uh, fundamental nature of consciousness in the universe. And this is where I think the neuroscience is expanding tremendously, but uh, something as gigantic as consciousness, you know, the only thing any human being has ever known is the inside of their own consciousness. So to pretend as modern materialist scientists do that consciousness doesn't even exist. Uh, that's what Daniel Dennett and others of, of his like would, uh, would try to argue, and, and they would also say there's no such thing as free will because they look at any conscious process as being uh, the uh, kind of epiphenomenon or side effect of the chemical reactions and electron fluxes in the brain. But this is uh, where we really have to leave materialism behind, and that's true in neuroscience too. Philosophy of mind uh, is a kind of a parallel discipline uh, that looks at some of the deep problems of the mind-brain relationship, uh, one of which for philosophy of mind uh, is the, the binding problem, the apparent unity of consciousness within an individual. If you're trying to explain it as the result of, of various disparate neuronal populations and neural networks all contributing, you know, what we see, what we hear, what we think, what we remember, sensing body position and space, our emotions, all of this kind of pull together into this unity of consciousness. Uh, what we realize is to truly explain it, you need to go far beyond the materialist mindset. And that's where I would say all of this work is opening up. It's through a consilience of evidence, not only from the hard problem of consciousness, that kind of the impossible problem for materialism of trying to explain a brain producing mind uh, through, uh, as I said, issues of philosophy of mind. And also this involves many uh, kind of empirical demonstrations in the world of parapsychology of non-local consciousness. That is that our consciousness, uh, which uh, our conventional neuroscience would say is limited to the physical senses, you know, the ears, the eyes, uh, taste, smell, touch, uh, all attached to this physical brain. No, we, we realize uh, things, things like remote viewing, which has been scientifically validated by any, beyond any reasonable doubt, the ability of psychic spies to discern information halfway around the world through various uh, protocols has been proven. Uh, I mean, these are real effects. Telepathy, as uh, Guillaume Playfair proved in his beautiful book, Twin Telepathy, uh, is a realistic feature of, of human existence. So 
The consilience of all this information and especially uh, contributed to by quantum physics, you know, the most successful uh, field in the history of science. And yet deep at its core, there are some profound mysteries of what it's telling us about the nature of reality. And in many ways, quantum physics has been insisting for more than a century that mind is primary in the universe. It's not derivative from the matter of the brain, but uh, the brain serves as a filter, a reducing valve to allow this primordial consciousness to manifest. And I think that neuroscience, especially enlivened by a lot of these other lines of evidence is expanding dramatically uh, to a position of realizing that mind is fundamental in the universe. It has huge implications for afterlife and reincarnation literature because it basically supports how all of it can be very real. Um, and I would say that consciousness is a very lively and hot topic in the world of neuroscience today, and it's all headed in a very positive direction, but only by letting go of that anchor, that albatross of materialism and its false views of the nature of reality. Mm, very good. So would you say that there is still a considerable resistance to um, going beyond the materialistic model um, of the brain and mind and, an, you know, in, in the general scientific community, a much more open uh, exploration and acceptance of this idea of consciousness being fundamental? Well, necessity is the mother of invention. And the necessity is to try and explain human uh, experiences and phenomena. Uh, and materialist science has been woefully inadequate at trying to do that. You know, the uh, people with the idea of brain creates consciousness, our existence is birth to death, nothing more. Uh, they, they get nowhere in trying to explain near-death experiences, shared death experiences, past life memories and children, indicative of reincarnation, et cetera. So uh, really by necessity, they're having to modify. You gotta remember the low hanging fruit is the stuff where you study the brain and you have this background assumption that it, it creates consciousness, but then you keep running into conflicts uh, that, that don't allow that, and especially in human experience that defies that simplistic materialist model. And uh, so it's very refreshing that they're opening to much bigger models of reality that will actually fit the data of human experience and do a much better job of explaining them. And uh, I think it's a real gift to the world that this is all coming, but it, it has to do with this broadening of understanding. And, and of course, remember that uh, for uh, you know, more than a century now, our culture has been uh, kind of beholden to science and scientists as the harbingers of truth, of people who know what's going on, who can teach the rest of us about the nature of reality. And for a long time, that, that has, mantle has been held up by materialists who studied the brain expecting to find consciousness there, even though you can go back many decades and find neuroscientists like John Eccles and um, others who realized, uh, no, that was wrong. They were uh, pursuing you know, a cul-de-sac that did not have the answers at all. And so now what we find is there are hundreds of scientists around the world who study consciousness. And for your viewing audience, if they want a primer on that, just go to galileocommission.org. I've, I'm one of the 100 plus scientific advisors to the Galileo Commission. And that website uh, has a position statement written by uh, Harold Wallach that uh, is a very beautiful and elegant uh, kind of explanation of our position of the primacy of consciousness. Uh, and I would highly recommend that, or people can always go to uvadops.org, University of Virginia Division of Perceptual Studies website. They have a tremendous amount of scientific data, publications, and peer-reviewed literatures, uh, book publications over the last six decades about this emerging uh, kind of model uh, of the nature of reality. In fact, um, I've just endorsed a, a book from the UVA group that uh, I think they can be very proud of. Uh, and I hardly endorse this book. It's the third in a trilogy by Ed Kelly about all the scientific uh, aspects of what we're discussing today. Uh, and that series of books began with Irreducible Mind back in 2008. There was an 800 page empirical treatise on, on you know, all of the, re the uh, human experience that doesn't fit the materialist model. And then they came out with Beyond Physicalism in 2015, which I also endorsed. And that book 
was a, a, a very deep dive into the theoretical prospects for all this. These are all edited by Ed Kelly, is the main editor, by the way. And then the third book that just uh, it will be coming out in April, not sure of the date, it's called uh, Consciousness Unbound. Again, um, Chief Editor Ed Kelly, uh, but an incredible scientific treatise on the nature of spirituality and science and how they dovetail and strengthen each other. It's one of the reasons why we've had so much trouble is written into the tenets of conventional uh, science uh, is this notion you cannot be talking about spirit or mind or consciousness, you know, stick to the material world. They were sentenced to do that, you know, hundreds of years ago by the church and the Council of Trent. Uh, but there's no reason why scientists today should still be beholden by such an edict from people trying to control other people's beliefs. So the scientific revolution about this is exploding out of the gates, but it's all about the fundamental nature of consciousness, the power of human free will and spirit and the reality of a spiritual universe and our nature as spiritual beings all in perfect alignment, not only alignment, but in many ways demanded by the emerging science of quantum physics, philosophy of mind, and the, and the science of the brain-mind connection. Amazing. So there is a lot of movement. Uh, I, I read a, a brief quote from uh, Dr. Dean Radden, uh, and he speaks about a perennial wisdom that says consciousness is fundamental and that consciousness comes before space and time. I think you would agree with that? I agree completely. It's one of the reasons why space and time and this kind of God equation of, of, the, of the universe unifying uh, uh, relativity and, and quantum physics has been so hard to come by is because ultimately uh, it's going to depend on consciousness. You know, our apparent time flow and all of that is something that plays into the appearance of reality as it's presented to us. Uh, it's kind of an intervening uh, kind of filter. You cannot get around this notion of consciousness and, and what it truly is. And it's not derivative from physical matter. Uh, and that's where I think Dean Radin uh, is also one of those scientists. He works at the Institute of Noetic Sciences. Go to noetic.org to learn a lot more about their work. He's published uh, uh, at least four books that I know of that have been absolutely revolutionary in uh, uh, his scientific work and how it supports this emerging model of reality. But as Dean points out, uh, much of this thinking of the oneness of the universe and our unification in that world of mind uh, goes back thousands of years in various spiritual traditions. And that's what I think we need to realize is there's been tremendous wisdom about the nature of reality that in many ways has been suppressed and lost over millennia. And now is when things are finally starting to come back together, uh, supporting uh, kind of a, a, a real uh, unification and synthesis of that kind of knowledge with the emerging science of today. And this emergent uh, or emerging understanding that you speak of, it seems to be a lot more compatible with the more spiritual teachings that are actually quite common in the East, such as we find in Hinduism and Buddhism. Would you think that is correct? Well, I would agree. I think that uh, uh, various spiritual traditions have contributed uh, uh, to this kind of thinking. I think the Baha'i faith in particular has been pretty much close to reality about a lot of it. Um, and of course, Christian mysticism, Kabbalism, mm -hmm. all of that has contributed somewhat. But your point is a very good one. In many ways, when you turn back the hands of time and really go back to the origins of this kind of deep and profound thinking, about the nature of reality. Uh, in many ways, you have to go back thousands of years and go to the spiritual traditions uh, of the East, uh, like Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, that in many ways, I think, laid out this groundwork. And, and I would not want to diminish, though, uh, the uh, incredible uh, kind of contributions of, of Christ. I grew up in a Christian uh, 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 home and a church. Uh, I certainly realize that some of the orthodox teachings of Christianity are, do not align with this. For example, uh, notions of reincarnation that are very heavily supported by modern scientific research. Some people would miss the fact that Jesus of Nazareth, of course, was a big teacher of, of reincarnation. He knew John the Baptist was reincarnated from an earlier prophet um, as an example. But of course, 
Jesus of Nazareth is not the one who fully influenced the teachings of modern Christianity when you look at the Council of Nicaea, the Council of Trent, other major interventions by other human beings trying to shape emerging Christianity, uh, in many ways distorted it. But if you go back to the original message of the prophets in all the great faiths, and certainly uh, Christ contributed, uh, from my point of view, two of the most important was this notion of how we're, you know, the, the kingdom of God is within us all. He acknowledged the primacy of mind, that mind is really important in determining all of emergent reality, which perfectly aligns with modern science. And he also stressed, um, really for the first time in a major way, the importance of love, that, that that God that dwells within the very source of our conscious awareness is uh, an infinitely loving source. And of course, near-death experiencers who have been there over thousands of years uh, and bathed in that ocean of love of that God force come back realizing there is nothing to fear. It's very uh, healing to know of that origin. And that is where I think Christ really contributed to our modern understanding. But in many ways, much of that great wisdom was already there from the Eastern spiritual traditions. So this consciousness that is the, the I, I guess, the foundation, the ground of all, is it a universal consciousness? Does it segment into separate consciousness in some way? What can you say about that? Well, I would say from everything that I've come to glean from my near-death experience, all my neuroscience knowledge, and the last 12 years of trying to reconcile it, working with hundreds of scientists and thousands of experiencers around the world, um, is a notion that really I came to see that that, God, that very awareness that we have of existence has its direct, uh, immediate, concrete origins in that infinitely loving uh, awareness of God, of the creator for the creation. And we're not separate from that. Uh, as much as you know, my religious teachings try to teach me, you know, God's up there, we're down here. No, uh, that, that God force of pure love is the source of our very conscious awareness of existence. And the more we can recognize that and realize our little ego mind is very, very, very far removed from that kind of infinitely loving God force, even though they're directly connected and the, that loving God force is at the very core of that conscious awareness of existence that I have as an ego-based human being. Uh, but what I've come to recognize, especially with daily meditations that I've been doing for at least the last decade or more, um, uh, in, in reuniting with that realm of my NDE and that beautiful ocean of love, uh, is really that oneness of consciousness is the best way to look at this. And that our higher soul is kind of a bridge that we have into that primordial mind. In many ways, it is the primordial determinant of all that emerges in the universe. Um, and, you know, our little ego mind is very kind of self-centered. So it can often be frustrated because the will of this kind of higher soul in that primordial mind is one that has the highest and best good for all involved, the evolution of all consciousness um, in, in um, you know, the appropriate direction is something that's very much governed by that, uh, by that force. I would say that all of our conscious evolution in many ways, as Pierre Teilhard de Chardin said in his uh, mid 20th century book, The Phenomenon of Man, he looked at evolution, not just from the puny little biological evolution on earth, but as a scientist, a paleontologist, and a French Jesuit priest, so very spiritual, he realized that evolution was occurring, but it was evolution of all consciousness and sentience throughout the universe. And I believe that is what is truly happening. And the more we can liberate ourselves from the little ego needs, and the ego uses fear and anxiety as its main tools, but the more in meditation I can let that little voice in my head, that ego mind, go into time out, the more I can develop a relationship with that infinitely loving God force that I first encountered in my NDE. And it's a very universal force. No matter what your kind of uh, life settings, most near-death experiencers come into a very kind of loving relationship with that force and find it to be tremendously healing. Uh, remember that life reviews, you know, your life flashing before your eyes happens in the presence of that infinitely loving force. So if we were busy handing out pain and suffering to others in our life, that life review can seem pretty hellish because we have to be on the business end of that receiving 
that kind of uh, pain and suffering we were handing out because your life review has not experienced it from your perspective. It's experienced from the emotional perspective of those who were impacted by your actions and even your thoughts. And so that life review in many ways serves as a course correction to teach us, yes, the golden rule is written into the very fabric of the universe. Treat others as you would like to be treated. That's the lesson near-death experiences bring back to this world. And it's all because of that unity of consciousness. We're dreaming the dream of the one mind. And in a life review, if you've been hurting other facets of that one mind, you have to feel that pain. Uh, and it's a beautiful course correction that over time nudges all of us towards being kinder, gentler, uh, and more harmonious with ourself and with other beings through progressive incarnations. But I believe this kind of awakening is what is coming to the world today, all through this science of consciousness and what it is kind of discovering is his primacy of mind and the binding force of love that has infinite power to heal at all levels. Well, if I understand correctly, I, I get the impression that we're speaking of a source of all, which is this universal consciousness. And then we have existence with these ap apparent separate identities and experiences. And I gather you're saying that the purpose of this is more like a, a schooling, a lesson for us to be able to evolve back to the source? Is that correct? I would say that's very much what it, you got to remember that we're at a very, we have a limited perspective on looking out over the vistas of time and space and of human destiny and understanding all of it. And I would say that when you remember kind of the, those rules of engagement, you realize, yes, we can see a horizon in the future, but whether that's the ultimate destiny for all of sentient life uh, throughout the cosmos? No, I don't think so. I think we can see what we're able to see at this point. And, and another way of putting that is over this kind of five to 10,000 year epoch in which we exist, the goal of humanity is to recover this oneness of mind, this uh, binding force of love, uh, this uh, incredible sense of how we are coming into oneness with the divine, but we're doing it uh, as a group evolving towards that omega point, as, um, as uh, Pierre Tillard de Chardin labeled it. Uh, and I would say, yes, that's very much the case. But, you know, I cannot uh, begin to envision what the goal of sentient life uh, that, say, evolves from humanity, moving thousands and, and millions of years in the future, I cannot say what that horizon point looks like. I can only say what I believe our horizon looks like now. And that is that we need to learn this lesson of the oneness of mind. It's one that uh, in many ways, as you said earlier, the those uh, traditions of Eastern spirituality going back thousands of years, were very much on target. And yet we somehow have wandered away from that deep message. And that's where I would, would say that the current revolution of uh, because it is heavily based in uh, coming to a deeper understanding of quantum physics and kind of the objectivity of science, as much as there is an objective world out there. I think one of the deepest lessons of quantum physics is that, the, that there is no objective physical world out there, independent of the observing mind. That's the important part, mm -hmm. is it all depends on the observing mind. And then when we start to realize uh, that we have that much uh, influence on our understanding through our perceptions and beliefs uh, and what have you, how they kind of filter all of that and shape it in a certain form for us, we start to realize the tremendous potential uh, for growth. Uh, that And the scientific side of this uh, is what allows for the sharing of objective ideas and information uh, as much as those are possible. I often look at our language as falsely limiting and defining and kind of confusing more than anything. Uh, some of these deep uh, lessons are only gleaned by personal experience, deep in meditative states. Uh, and you can try and use language to tell other people about them, but ultimately it's best for others to go there too and discover their own deep truths from um, exploration of mind. Uh, but I think that uh, 
the scientific aspect of this is what will make it different from the last 5,000 years, for example, of having various religions based on the teachings of prophets who had all been to the territory of near-death experience in various fashions uh, and tried to bring back those lessons. And then for all those many centuries, it was a question of whether through prayer and meditation, others could come to see and know the same things so they could believe it most fully. Well, now with the objective lead of science, uh, helping us to understand this. Um, and, and I would say that those Ed Kelly books from UVA DOPS that I mentioned a few minutes ago go a long way towards really shaping the scientific argument. Uh, certainly our book, Living in a Mindful Universe, published in 2017, goes a long way towards pulling all of this together and helping people realize, and you don't have to wait for all the scientific community to wake up to this. Uh, all of us can uh, jump right in uh, with kind of the power of our will. And it begins with um, mind over matter, say, of healing self and things like that. And uh, a lot of what modern physicians look at as healing uh, is being radically altered by power of mind as we come to realize placebo effect is just the beginning. I mean, near-death experiences with profound healing, like my case, Anita Morjani, where uh, her uh, advanced stage four lymphoma disappeared after she had an NDE, or Mary C. Neal, the orthopedic surgeon, who wrote the book To Heaven and Back, who had a, a over 30 minute warm water drowning in Chile while kayaking in the late 90s. And she had a full recovery. I mean, these recoveries in the setting of near death experiences are mind boggling to the physician because they completely defy our modern notions of what is possible in healing. Uh, and yet they're just showing us as we've known by acknowledging placebo effect for more than six decades, uh, that it really shows us that we all have tremendous power to heal ourselves as we can gain this kind of uh, interaction with that uh, primordial mind and, and higher soul and learn that healing is a natural part of becoming more whole through knowing ourselves and our relationship with the universe more fully. Well, that is uh, very interesting, especially coming from a doctor. So would you say that if mind is primary and now speaking about illness in particular, I mean, how far would you go with the idea that the power of the mind, if channeled properly, can heal? Uh, how far would you go with that? Well, you can go very far. If you go to noetic.org, and that's Institute of Noetic Sciences website, uh, and put in the search term spontaneous remission, you will uncover a book. It's now out of press, but you can download the whole thing for free legally from their site. Uh, it was published in 1995 and it has more than 3,500 cases of people healing from cancer, healing from advanced infections, some even healing from congenital deformities that they were born with, um, and other healing, all of which exceeds any kind of Western medical uh, intervention that those patients had. And that's why that work is so important. And, and currently, um, they're, um, the scientists at uh, Noetic Society are going back through 25 more years of data that they've accumulated in that database on spontaneous remission. And I cannot wait till they uh, go public with that new da data set. It's astonishing. And, and as people read this and become familiar with all of the many, many ways that people have been able to heal through the power of their belief, then we all realize what's possible. And I think the next step is really as that wave of knowledge kind of takes over the medical profession and medical education, and we have a whole new generation of physicians who are more deeply trained in the power of kind of our spiritual nature to assist in our healing, uh, the world will change dramatically and it will change for the better. Uh, just finding out you know, why we have many of these illnesses is an important part of kind of getting to the illness of the ego and uh, some of the other kind of struggles we have uh, uh, in living these lives, but the lessons we can learn. And those lessons are always about coming more into wholeness. Uh, and certainly I've come to realize that any physical, mental, or emotional health or healing is fundamentally spiritual. And in that sense, when I use the word spiritual, for me, it just has two main ingredients. Uh, one is that it acknowledges the oneness of mind, that we're all sharing that kind of uh, God consciousness uh, at the core. So if we hurt another, we're hurting ourselves. So a, a spirituality involves a tremendous 
kind of expression of yes to the oneness of uh, our existence. And the other is a shared common um, uh, purpose and meaning to this existence, that it is actually going somewhere. So when we talk about, uh, say from UVA, more than 2,500 cases of past life memories in children indicative of reincarnation discovered over the last six decades, we realize that in that bigger setting, we're just try trying to explain human existence uh, as it truly is. And as it truly is, involves our coming back again and again as souls in this process of growing towards that oneness with the divine. Uh, so all of this is a, a very positive development, especially because of the scientific study of all this. That is where the whole world can get on board with agreement. This is where it's headed. Uh, to date, some of the biggest trouble with um, you know, having the world at large to accept all this is that many of who are respected scientists in various positions have refused to even look at the data. Uh, there are neuroscientists who are totally clueless on the contributions uh, from parapsychology and non-local consciousness and don't even understand how quantum physics is related to all this. And so the more uh, the relevant scientists start to actually study the data, uh, and there already are hundreds around the world who are, uh, that's when the scientific community at large will start to make tremendous shifts. And finally, the science media, you know, like the scientific section of New York Times, I mean, they are still proudly ignorant, you know, just all over this materialism, brain creates consciousness, near-death experiences are just woo-woo nonsense. I mean, so th the problem is, you know, you need some real intelligence out there. Uh, and uh, some of those materialists uh, uh, just are not willing to study the data, so they don't have anything intelligent to say about the mind-body uh, question anymore. So uh, their opinion is irrelevant, but as we move forward, more and more scientists are getting on board, and that's where this world will shift, because when you start to study the evidence, there's no doubt about the direction in which it leads. So the, the two areas that uh, I, I know you are very much involved with, um, researching and I, I imagine writing about near-death experiences and in contact with other researchers who are um, investigating the, that phenomena. And as well as you've mentioned a number of times is the evidence of reincarnation. Both of those, it sounds like you and many other uh, more progressive scientists are accepting as fact now, whereas maybe a lot of other people in the science community are not. But I know there has been a lot of research in both these two areas with some very uh, convincing evidence that I think would be good to share with the general population. Uh, well, yes, well, um, there's a beautiful book that just came out uh, from Dr. Bruce Grayson, uh, it came out a few weeks ago, and this book is called After. It is his memoir as a uh, skeptical scientist and physician who has studied near-death experiences for more than 45 years. Uh, and it's a very honest, open, authentic, uh, book that I think will do a world of good because when you look at this world through uh, the eyes of Bruce Grayson, even being very hardcore skeptical and scientific, what you realize is the evidence is absolutely overwhelming. And for whatever societal reasons, uh, we've been you know, unwilling to let go of this myth of, of physicalism that you know, our existence is birth to death and nothing more that the brain creates consciousness doesn't reflect the experience of tens of millions of human beings who have had near-death experiences, shared death experiences, after-death communications, deathbed visions, past life memories, suggestive reincarnation, the entire world of transpersonal psychology, thanks to the work of Carl Jung, uh, Charles Tart, uh, Brian Weiss, Michael Newton, Stan Groff, and others, uh, looking at how important you know, hypnotic regression and meditation are and recovering past life memories that then start to make much more sense of the events of this life. So all of this has a very kind of practical intent. It's to better understand the phenomena of human existence. Um, Near-death experiences in many ways are just the tip of the spear. But of course, NDEs in and of themselves will never tell you what happens after you die because NDEers didn't die. 
But when you put it together with this big package, and, and that's what we do in our book, Living in a Mindful Universe, um, and uh, certainly uh, I would say Bruce's book does that for uh, NDEs and Ed Kelly's books, especially Consciousness Unbound, does it for all manner of kind of scientific investigation of consciousness. But uh, what we come to realize is you study the data, you realize the materialist physical model fails miserably. In fact, it can't even get us out of the starting gate to explain everyday normal consciousness in a normal setting, much less all these other uh, kind of examples of uh, kind of exotic consciousness. And so really, um, you know, it's time to quit depending on the low hanging fruit that was easy to grab, you know, studying the brain and looking at correlations and pretending that they might be related to the bigger things we're trying to study. No, let's look at the bigger things we're trying to study. And that's what this whole new world of looking at consciousness with a much bigger lens uh, through many different lines of inquiry uh, brings to the table. And that's where I think that there's tremendous promise. Uh, it's more demanding. Yeah. You can't just sit around your armchair and philosophize and be wrong anymore. You have to dig deep and start um, reviewing the literature and then uh, uh, meditating and uh, going into centering prayer in your own consciousness. But uh, it's all for the better. The near-death experiences that we've just spoken about, as you said, the, they, they didn't actually die, even though the bodies and the brain in particular uh, during that period was effectively not operating. And yet there were conscious experiences, as you've uh, explained, extraordinarily vivid and in, in a great number of variations. What would be in that body if, uh, when the consciousness is having these experiences? And sometimes people even are conscious of, of see their bodies laying there. Right. Well, I think that, you know, our consciousness, um, uh, I think there's, there's certainly enough reports out there that our consciousness is not always just here or there. And I believe we can actually uh, kind of bilocate and we can, you know, be in the body that is dying, that's deep in coma with, you know, one foot, but another foot can be in that spiritual realm where we're already among uh, souls of departed loved ones and that kind of higher knowing. Um, and I, I would say it's uh, uh, the important thing to remember is just that consciousness should be followed as kind of the, the line of human experience of what a sentient being, a human being experiences kind of in and out of the material realm and dream states under the influence, say, of psychedelic plant medicines like psilocybin, uh, DMT, LSD, things like that. Um, all of these are examples of consciousness that contribute to the bigger picture. Uh, in fact, uh, I would say the psychedelic studies are very important because there's a whole slew of recent papers over the last nine years uh, that have uh, used functional MRI, magnetoencephalography, and other techniques of looking at the brain uh, on people under the influence of such plant medicines like psilocybin. The interesting thing is you find that the brain goes dark. Uh, you know, anyone who's ever taken those kind of substances would think if they believe the brain has anything to do with consciousness, they would think, oh my gosh, my brain must be lighting up like a Christmas tree, uh, having all that phenomenal experience that is so kind of shocking. Um, and yet that's the opposite of what you find. Uh, you study the brain and the brain is going dark. There's no part of the brain in these studies that increases in activity. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, all regions decrease in activity. And one of the early reports uh, from Robin Carhart Harris in Imperial College London, 2012, they actually used a visual analog scale to assess the kind of transcendent and phenomenal nature of the experience, the more kind of exotic and transcendent, detailed, memorable, uh, kind of shocking ultra reality the experience was, the darker the brain had gone. Uh, so it's really uh, amazing. Uh, but the evidence, you know, when you get to the neuroscience, philosophy of mind, all these imaging studies, you start to realize, no, the brain is not doing this. It is simply facilitating it. It serves as a filter. Filter theory is something that uh, William James, uh, FCS Schiller proposed in the late uh, 1800s. 
uh, Henri Bergson in France, uh, Frederick W. H. Myers in the early 20th century, and also Aldous Huxley were big proponents of filter theory. Uh, it just basically says the brain is related to consciousness. It serves as a filtering mechanism through which this primordial mind can project conscious awareness into a physical being existing in a certain space time with a certain sense of self in this reality. And yet, you know, dreams and psychedelic experiences, near death experiences, all of them, them show us that we're much bigger than something that is just compressed into, uh, you know, a three and a half pound gelatinous mass floating in the warm, dark bath in the middle of my skull. But we're, our consciousness is much more than that. And that's where we gain tremendous power and uh, our notions of will and determining our own destiny uh, come into focus when we start to realize the powers we said earlier of all those cases of spontaneous remission, as an example. And, and so then what would be the next step, not near death experience, but actual death, what, what that transition that often is referred to as process of reincarnation, um, which, as you say, was probably part of the early Christian teachings, as well as it is in Eastern religions. But what, what, how do you understand that transition? Actual death. And right. Well, I, well, I would say that the near-death experience gives us a beautiful picture of what to expect. The interesting thing to me as a physician is when you study thousands of such cases and they have all these differing medical parameters and situations that lead you in there. And yet the commonality of experience is stunning across millennia, across continents, across belief systems. People who study NDEs remark on, oh my gosh, all these similarities that completely defy uh, you know, the notion that they're all just some chaotic hallucinations of a dying brain and nothing more. There's so much more to it. And uh, especially when you put it together with this much bigger picture from transpersonal psychology, the past life memories in children, suggestive reincarnation, all of that, you just start to glean this much bigger picture of consciousness um, and the theater of consciousness that enables so much more to happen. Uh, in terms of our souls, our, our kind of soul mission, uh, our work together with soul groups and relationships that get reshuffled in uh, subsequent uh, incarnations, all in this process of growth. So it's, it's quite different from, uh, for example, I, I would say a, one Buddhist interpretation of reincarnation is uh, that it's uh, this endless uh, wheel of suffering and your job is to get off the wheel. Whereas I would say this this vision that is much more fueled by uh, the study of near-death experiences going back thousands of years is one that supports a process of growth, of improvement in kind of grace, uh, coming more into oneness with that divine, infinitely loving God force, uh, and then proceeding on to who knows what is the next horizon for the destiny of humankind and sentience on earth in this kind of growth. Um, we don't know, but uh, I, I would say that we're finally getting to a point where even though we've diverged wildly uh, over the last few centuries, we're finally getting back on a pathway through this uh, reunion and synthesis of science and spirituality to truly allow us uh, to move forward in our understanding. And I think that's what this uh, awakening, this awareness uh, in the scientific community about the fundamental nature of consciousness is really all about. And so in this process of, say, the death and then reincarnation, I know there's been quite a lot of study done um, in that area, and I know you are familiar with them because you spoke of Jim Tucker on a previous occasion. From the case studies that have been presented, what sort of possibilities are there for this reincarnation in terms of when and where and how it takes place? Well, you know, it's interesting. It's, it's kind of wide open. Um, you got to remember there are a few things about the UVA data that in many ways kind of restrict it and confine it uh, and limit the conclusions. Uh, for one thing, they only deal with children who remember past lives. Uh, and the reason for that was they didn't want to get into uh, adults who might be fabricating things, you know, children were simpler because young children, it was 
much less likely that uh, they were being fed these, these stories. And when you read uh, Jim Tucker's work, you'll realize the links they go to to make sure that nobody is fabricating, uh, you know, kind of people aren't misleading themselves about a given case um, and things like that. You have to be sure that there's no such fabrication or uh, shoddy study methods. And I think when you read Ian Stevenson's work and Jim Tucker's work, you'll realize it's all of a very high uh, level and, and makes perfect sense. If, if they had had a low bar all along, their research wouldn't be worth much of anything. And yet they've had a very high bar, which they continue to set. And I would say that makes their research worth a tremendous amount. Uh, I mean, you certainly get that impression when you read Bruce Grayson's book today, because I know from talking with him and from hearing him present, that uh, his, in his book, he could have gone a whole lot further in terms of what he uh, tried to express as possibilities, but he kept it very kind of confined and constrained because that skepticism is very valuable. Uh, I came through my NDE realizing I had to start back at square one and question everything I ever thought I knew about anything about the nature of reality in this universe, if I had any hope of getting to a deeper truth. And by rejecting everything and rebuilding it from the ground up, I've been able to, to kind of come up with, with a set of ideas that I think work very well in explaining the nature of reality. And um, that's what uh, th this kind of hardcore scientific skeptical outlook is all about. Uh, but you know, then when uh, you, you realize that uh, uh, the UVA DOPS group is having to toe the line so heavily with this kind of uh, hardcore skepticism, that in some ways it, it does limit what I think they could express as the true horizon of vision of where this is all headed, because they have to make sure they maintain that credibility in the scientific skeptical uh, community. Uh, and from my point of view, when you read their results and their methodology and uh, hear them present, it is all very high bar, very well done. Um, and if you read Ed Kelly's newest book, Beyond, uh, I mean, uh, Consciousness Unbound, you'll realize where this is all headed, but it is very deep territory indeed. And this is not just the common knowledge that comes to the armchair philosopher out there in the world who thinks that based on his own experience, if he hasn't dug very deep, that he's going to come up with all the answers. No, this kind of work digs very deep goes into some of the most amazing experiences that humans have ever reported over thousands of years in ways that have been uh, uh, very well validated in terms of techniques and methodology. And that's where I think the real power of this lies. And the more people open their minds and study, study the evidence and especially start going within on their own, uh, because I cannot imagine anyone pretending that they have something to say about the mind-brain relationship and the nature of consciousness if they haven't spent years on a daily basis going deep into their own consciousness. It's absolutely essential. Um, and, uh, you know, to just study it in books and DVDs and presentations and think you know what's going on is very misleading. And this internal work, as we would call it, I assume you're referring to some form of introspection, meditation, and I know that you practice uh, using sacred acoustics on a regular basis. Can you speak about, you know, what, which one of these approaches you utilize and how it has been useful for you? Right. Well, I first realized, I guess it was about two years after my coma, I was, had read 150 books. I was getting deeply into every bit of this, trying to understand it. And I realized that uh, I had to go within and explore my own consciousness. And around that very same time, I had read several articles about binaural beat brainwave entrainment. Uh, and to me, it was a fascinating uh, tool. Uh, it sounded like it would be very useful. And, and my 12 years of work since then have borne that out tremendously. I use sacred acoustics on a daily basis, an hour to a day. Uh, differential frequency brainwave entrainment, full disclosure, is a co-founder of Sacred Acoustics, is my life partner, and also the uh, co-author of my third book, Living in a Mind for Universe. Her name is Karen Newell. Uh, in fact, it was uh, my urging to Karen and her business partner, Kevin Cossey, who's the sound engineer uh, who makes the tones, uh, to, uh, my urging to them way back in 2011 that this stuff is really amazing, great. I was finding tremendous personal utility in it. And I urged them to start making these tones for the general public. And that's what became Sacred Acoustics. Uh, and just to cut to the chase for your audience, 
I believe what's going on there, and this is something we discussed pretty fully in Living in a Mindful Universe, is that these, um, these differential frequency uh, sounds, uh, so say, for example, 100 hertz, 100 cycles per second in one ear, 104 hertz, 104 cycles per second in the other ear, and somewhere in the brain, you generate that four hertz difference between them. The same is true if the difference is one hertz or up to about 20 hertz. Once I get beyond 20 hertz, you can't, the brain doesn't do this anymore. It can't com uh, combine them. Uh, but between, uh, you know, half a hertz and up to, say, 20 hertz, you can drive that lower brain stem to emit a very powerful ascending signal. And I think that's one of the reasons why these sounds are so uh, effective at, at engendering transcendental states of conscious awareness. Binaural beats were noted in the late 20th century to be very effective in both remote viewing and in out-of-body experiences. And, and once I read that literature and kind of understood where it was going, that's why I, I jumped fully into binaural beats. And then uh, working with uh, Karen uh, and Kevin uh, to make the tones of sacred acoustics has been a tremendous asset of my life. Uh, to be kind of an alpha tester, to get to dive in deep to hundreds of new uh, products and help kind of uh, drive their design has been very powerful. And I talk in the, in the book, Living in a Mindful Universe, I share several examples of the kind of extreme power that I've witnessed in my own explorations, not only in recovering memories from my NDE, but in developing much richer relationship with the various denizens and forces and powers of infinite healing love that I first encountered in my NDE. Well, I've developed those uh, through nurturing them with sacred acoustics meditations involving these circuits in the lower brainstem uh, for uh, a decade now and found it to be of tremendous power. Uh, people who read uh, the uh, Living in a Mindful Universe will come to see how my adoptive father, who had passed over four years before my coma, who was not, to my shock and chagrin, a feature of my NDE. Uh, again, pointing out one of the unusual features of my NDE was the amnesia for Evan Alexander's life. I had no memory of words, language of Evan Alexander's life, any of the events. That amnesia uh, shaped my NDE in very strange ways, uh, very consistent with most NDEs, and yet that amnesia um, is what prevented me from having a full score of 32 on the Grace and NDE scale. My score was only 29. That had to do with the fact that by being amnesic, I did not recognize uh, loved ones there. But my birth father was not apparent to me at the time. Uh, and I use that, that word to kind of a double entendre joke that he used with me when he finally did appear in a sacred acoustic style binaural beat brainwave entrainment meditation a little over two years after my coma. Uh, and that was kind of the beginning of my realizing the full power of this uh, binaural beat brainwave entrainment and how it can liberate conscious awareness uh, to much more fully unite with that primordial mind and that higher soul. So this is your preferred method of introspection and going within and uh, accessing these more refined levels of consciousness. I would think that you also support other forms of meditation, which are quite commonly practiced by other people. Is I would, absolutely. I mean, I think there are many ways uh, to get to the top of the mountain. Uh, sacred acoustics, binaural beats is just one. Centering prayer. Uh, for, for me, all of my binaural beat brainwave entrainments are a form of centering prayer, where I immediately get into that oneness uh, with that God force and see the higher good for all uh, involved in any kind of ongoing uh, uh, issue in my life. But yes, anything where we can quiet the little ego voice, the linguistic voice in the head, uh, that is really uh, your, your foe in trying to get to this deeper knowledge, a little you know, voice in the head, our running stream of thoughts. So many people think, well, that's my consciousness. No, it is not. Your consciousness is your awareness of that voice. And your awareness can grow a lot richer and has far greater material to pay attention to than the little running stream of thoughts coming from a part of brain that's no bigger than that. My left temporal lobe, uh, you have Broca's area that produces speech in the frontal lobe. Then you have Wernicke's area um, that interpret speech. And that's where so much of our modeling of the world occurs with our very language. Uh, and, and so the first goal in meditation, from my perspective, is to put that little voice. And I love how Michael Singer in his book, The Untethered Soul, he calls the running stream of thoughts in the head, that voice inside, he calls it the annoying roommate. 
Yes, that's what that is. There's nothing magical about it. It's little more than a parlor trick. Your, your consciousness is the awareness of that voice. And that is a part of you you can develop much more fully. Um, and, but the step in meditation is to use that linguistic voice to state an intention, make a request, ask the universe, ask the God force for a question. You know, why did that experience happen in my last meditation? Teach me more. But then that linguistic voice goes into timeout. And that's when you learn to focus on the breathing, focus on the tones, ride those tones. Before you know it, you're not even aware of those tones anymore because you can go very deep when you can release like that and let that little voice from your thoughts in your head go into timeout. It's not running the show. And the more you do this, the more you can learn to kind of uh, run with that higher soul that's not limited by a sense of here now and a sense of self. That higher soul uh, has a very broad purview over events of your life, past lives, future lives, all of your kind of soul relationships, and all of that can be explored going deep within mind, within consciousness, through whatever technique gets you there. But first and foremost, the order of business is put that little impish teenager into time out. That voice in your head is not who you deeply and truly are. So it is a process of, of moving into silence where the discursive thinking mind is, as you say, time uh, is in time out. And as you go into that silence and stillness, the, the awareness becomes increasingly sharp, I would think. It does. And one of the um, things I often use, especially if I'm trying to get in touch with uh, any kind of past life material, is I'll go back to early childhood memories. Uh, anything I remember between ages uh, you know, one or two and say six or seven. And then I just start following those memories. It's interesting when you follow memory traces, you start to discover more and more kind of connections that you wouldn't necessarily just remember spontaneously. Uh, and I found that to be a very rich way to kind of disconnect from the here and now uh, and uh, kind of enter into this dialogue with my kind of higher self that's had access to uh, a lot more material. And as you ride in that, especially with a, a proper intention early in the meditation, what you find is often the universe will then present you with various kind of uh, uh, situations and analogies. It's kind of like being in a dream space. Um, and yet, uh, uh, often the scenes can be much more real than I normally associate with a dream. And, and they can come up and I can either pay attention to them or pay them no mind and they might evaporate and then something new might come up, uh, you know, a while later. But I, I find that uh, anything the universe presents to me in that setting, I, I will take seriously as being part of my soul journey. And so I try to pay attention to it and then ask more in the meditation to have it more fully evolve and things like that. Um, but it's uh, astonishing how uh, the universe will pre start presenting you with material there. Uh, and I know that uh, famous scientists, uh, uh, Thomas Edison, one of the biggest inventors in American history, uh, uh, Albert Einstein would float around in a sailboat looking at the sky daydreaming. Robert Louis Stevenson and Edison had similar techniques where they'd use weights in their hands and as they drop, it would wake them up and they'd take a few micro naps. That gave them enough hypnagogic time to come up with new creative ideas. Um, you know, many discoveries in science and physics, in the art, in music, uh, Beethoven, Salvador Dali, they all had techniques of getting into hypnagogic space, into that kind of never world where you're not using that little linguistic voice following the breadcrumbs of thought uh, to your understanding, but you're opening wide to let the universe present you with these things. That's what all these scientists and artists and musicians were doing was opening their mind in that hypnagogic space to allow them to more fully engage with their higher soul and the creativity of the universe. So anyone who uh, uses creativity in their work uh, can benefit from developing much richer practices of going within and exploring this universal mind, uh, especially when you have techniques of putting that little um, limiting voice in your head, the ego mind into timeout. I just, uh, when you mentioned about uh, in that process, sometimes you intentionally try to remember something from a much earlier time and 
you know, things do come into the mind with such great clarity that you probably had forgotten all about. I'm just wondering how far back uh, have you ever have you ever had a what seemed to be a past life memory? Yes, there have been a number of them, and of course. The problem is, as a scientist, what I then look for is the objective identification that proves that past life. Uh, and, you know, all of my past life kind of memories um, have been uh, not as, you know, some superstar in history that would be recorded forever, but as, as kind of an everyday person. Uh, and, and those include memories on sailing ships and uh, memories in caves and out on the plains and uh, you know, going way back, I don't know how far, but uh, back to a time when, you know, uh, whatever soul I'm sensing was living in a cave with a, a, gr a group of other, uh, you know, humans, but way back. So, uh, yeah, there's plenty of material there. And, and you might, people legitimately question, well, is that my memory? Can I claim that memory as part of my soul line? Or is it just something random out of the Akashic records or the quantum hologram that somehow the universe is kind of you know, dipped my way for unknown reasons. I don't think the universe gives us random information. So I, I try to pay attention to all of it. And this is where keeping a journal of trying to really uh, kind of keep note and record of, of what's going on in these experiences is important uh, because often the answer comes before the question. And, and so you really have to be open-minded about how we put it all together. You know, we're used to a flowing narrative, a story like our linguistic brain kind of spills out that stream of thoughts all day long. And the universe doesn't necessarily give us information packaged in that same little linear narrative. Um, but the interesting thing is we have the power to assimilate it all. That's what a life review is all about. You ask people who've had a life review and a near death experience. And of course they go back thousands of years, these reports of life review, uh, and it can all happen at once. And the memories are sharp and clear and detailed. They're not vague sepia tinted memories. These are sharp relivings of events. And not only that, you're experiencing it from the perspective of people around you who were affected by your thoughts and actions. So it's an extraordinarily rich kind of revisiting of, of those situations and not some a vague kind of memory limited uh, form of e expression, but uh, extraordinary. And if the universe can do that to us in a life review when we're leaving our physical body, Yes, the universe has power to give us a lot of information, and we do have the power to assimilate it. Once we're free of the kind of perceived limitations of the brain in the here and now in the sense of self, but we're more through the veil uh, and kind of resonating at that much higher level where much more memory becomes available and, and visions uh, and understanding and guidance. So there's a tremendous amount. When you learn to trust in that universe, uh, that's a tremendous step forward. And I learned to trust it during my NDE. Wonderful. Well, this has been an extremely, uh, you know, um, thought-provoking discussion. I, I really do appreciate it. I, I'll just finish with one last question, because even though you, you have had a very rich and full life, but you, you know, all being as we expect, have many years left to continue in this uh, quest. And I'm just wondering, what are you thinking of devoting yourself more fully to in the coming years? And, and what areas are you looking forward to exploring? Well, I feel like a kid in a candy store. I couldn't be more fortunate. I'm grateful for every single breath. My NDE taught me the extreme power of gratitude and forgiveness as beautiful tools for humanity. Uh, and I cannot imagine uh, being happier doing anything other than what I'm doing, which is trying to help with a scientific investigation of consciousness, understanding nature of reality, sharing with the world where I see that it benefits the world, any of the knowledge that comes from that research. And I hope to have many decades of that kind of work left in me. I will never get bored or tired of this, I promise you. It's what Karen and I do day and night is we talk and live every bit of this kind of emerging science and understanding of consciousness, meditation, going within the power of mind over matter. Every bit of that is well worth putting every breath I have left on this 
earth in this body into. And I'm sure I will have future incarnations that will be similarly dedicated. Hopefully by then we will have made a tremendous amount of progress, which I think is truly coming to this world. Uh, but it's uh, fascinating. We meet the most wonderful people, including, of course, all of you in the Theosophical Society. We love going to Chicago, and hopefully we'll be back up there again before too long. Uh, but we travel the world, really, and we meet a tremendous number of people who are also interested in these questions. Uh, and I can't imagine uh, you know, a more wonderful group of people to know than those who are deeply uh, kind of intrigued by this mystery of life and consciousness and are following uh, everything they can in their power to discover the deep truths underlying it all.